Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dan Hussey with Zener Ag Hedge, bringing you a strategy of the week update here for August 11th, 2022. Remember, trading futures involves risk and is not suitable for all investors. And everything I talk about here today is just my own opinion and not a direct trade recommendation. Glad to have my microphone situation figured out for my last little video there. I certainly will be redoing that at a special report on the S&P here uh, when we're done. Um, but wanted to uh, get our strategy of the week going uh, because we've got a lot to talk about going into a WASDE report tomorrow. Um, let's begin with the, the, you know, some of the fundamentals that we don't seem to be trading right now uh, in the market. And remember, if you want to catch this broadcast every week and join the mailing list to get the uh, webinar link and the link to the uh, video thereafter, email to you. Sign up links uh, for that and our Zaner Egg. Ag Daily newsletter are available in the comment section and the information section for this video. So six to ten day precipitation outlooks have, you know, generally shifted to a little bit more favorable than what we've seen the last two weeks, putting, uh, you know, some rain potentially in the forecast here into and through the end of August. Uh, eight to 14 day forecasts also, uh, you know, those areas that got plenty of rain um, aren't getting it and the areas that maybe really needed it might uh, with the exception of Kansas and Nebraska here, unfortunately, but we will see. Uh, this is, of course, all forecasts that are subject to change, but even with these better than expected forecasts coming, it doesn't seem that row crops want to sell off at all here, uh, and we finished today with a pretty good close, could barely break through yesterday's highs on corn, um, couldn't do so on the beans, but closing at or near highs, certainly with some outside markets like the meal and bean oil looking pretty bullish with crude oil trading above 94 right now, uh, things look pretty good um, compared to where we were, you know, a couple weeks ago. Temperature-wise, uh, we're looking cooler in the forecasts uh, and below average temperatures or normal temperatures this time of year in both the eight, 6 to 10 and 8 to 14 day forecasts. So um, pretty favorable conditions for soybeans here, which leads me to believe that any kind of rally we might see out of tomorrow's report, if we even do get one, and certainly the rally that we're seeing now is kind of threatened that we might, you know, be retracing some of this price action here going forward. And again, I bring up the idea that last year um, at this time, and let's uh, let's actually begin there. Uh, last year, one of these charts here. Here we go. We got November beans from last year. Um, it's important to remember that Novi beans uh, actually, you know, really sold off and didn't find um, find lows. Uh, that's corn. Where's my beans? Uh, let's just, there it is. Novi beans from 2021. Uh, didn't find a low until $14 there. Um, hmm, something is wrong with this chart. I apologize. I wasn't expecting that, but there, um, ah, I've got the nearest chart up. That is why. Uh, let's pull up the daily charts real quick and that will fix everything and give me the price action I'm actually curious about. There it is. Uh, I was going to say $14 for November 21 beans was a little high for, <laughs> for what I was looking at. Okay, so we're sitting somewhere right around here on this chart, right? We had a, you know, a potential for a nice rally back in the range that we're in. Last year, we rallied from 13 bucks up to a test of near 14 before you know falling apart for the next several months. And we didn't find a low in the bean complex until the end of life for this November contract, which certainly could be a precursor for what we're, you know, to expect now through the next, you know, couple months. Um, the old crop, uh, or at that time, new crop for corn, however, had bottomed uh, sometime, you know, around uh, July, ran up to a test of $6, came back down in September for a test of that low, uh, but then found a low in the corn complex sometime in um, early, you know, to mid-September there, a little bit more in line with the price action we're seeing now and, you know, the idea that we could find a pretty early uh, harvest low. But it's this WASDE report and the spike that we had last year around this time uh, that concerns me. You know, it's we had a bull trend. We had a spike up. We couldn't break through the figure at $6 and then we sold off for the next month um, to find a low uh, that was, you know, the best buying opportunity for the year, you know, for the, that crop year uh, going forward. And I'm not going to rule that out you know, given everything that we have this year as well. Uh, obviously, production, we can argue about that um, until, you know, we're blue in the face. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is the price on the chart is the price on the chart. And we are very, you know, following pretty closely, you know, the analogs of last year being a little bullish into this August WASDE report. Um, and uh, if we don't see follow through thereafter, 
you know, we might just be met with, you know, a, a wall of selling pressure uh, that could take us a little lower in the near term. And then, you know, before we finally bottom out. But with all that being said, let's take a look at what some of the um, some of the numbers for uh, this report could be. Let's start with the analyst expectations for the U.S. ending stocks. Uh, this is all compiled by Karen Braun from Reuters. A special thanks to Karen, as always. You can follow her on Twitter at, at K-A-N-N-B-W-X. Uh, for corn, um, old crop estimates here uh, for corn come in at a 1.5 billion bushel uh, ending stock number, uh, kind of uh, right in the middle of the range of analyst guests. Uh, that is slightly higher than the USDA July number. Um, and uh, soybeans comes in at 226 million, uh, again, slightly higher than our USDA July number. The new crop estimates, though, uh, given, you know, assuming that the USDA doesn't diminish demand on this report, which they very much might, um, 1.4 billion bushels there for corn. Uh, that is actually lower than our July estimates of 1.47. And of course, soybeans at 230 million, right on par with that USDA estimate. Uh, for July. Uh, wheat comes in at 650 million bushels. That is slightly higher here from the, from the um, July estimates. And I think that much of the, many of these numbers are baking into a cake, probably a little bit more uh, favorable yield scenarios than we might actually see. But remember, these analyst guests are trying to guess where the USDA is going to tell us where yield, acreage, and end production is uh, when you take out that aggregate demand. Now, the thing that strikes us about this report is we were going into it a few weeks ago thinking that, you know, this is really just going to be a yield report, but that isn't the case. And if it's just a yield report, then they might, you know, the USDA has within their abilities and their powers and probably would do something with demand to offset that to keep balance sheets relatively static from where they are at this time of year. But we'll, you know, that's yet to see what they do. The problem is, is that we are also potentially going to get another acreage number here and an adjustment to it based off of resurvey data that they have collected. Um, so that can change things here. There's three moving pieces to the puzzle on this one. Uh, so, you know, out of all the reports we've had this year, this is one that could be, um, you know, either a very big surprise to the market or a really big nothing burger. Um, last year at this time, they surprised us a little bit that went the way of the farmer. But again, that new spike rally didn't see follow through. Uh, and, you know, given that we are just right in the middle of the ranges like we were last year at this time, I'm, you know, a little cautious that that is the type of outcome we might see. On the world ending stocks number, trade estimates for corn came in at uh, 312 uh, million metric tons here. Um, that is slightly higher, just a 0.4 or 0.2 higher than uh, the USDA or, uh, July estimates. 88.95 million metric tons on soybeans, a little bit higher there. Uh, than the USDA July number, and wheat coming in actually slightly lower than the USDA number. Um, I would be surprised if they do much with wheat on this report, given the Ukrainian situation and really the unknown factor of how much wheat could make it out of uh, you know, the Black Sea at this time. Even though all the, anal all the expectations and an analysis I've done of how many boats it would take to move a substantial amount of grain and everything else, it just doesn't add up that there will be a, a, a consequential amount of grain coming out of the Black Sea this year. Uh, there's just too much risk involved. Uh, the new crop estimates here of 309 million metric tons for corn is well below the USDA estimates. That's likely coming down because of lower uh, expectations and, and uh, crop production out of South America. Uh, we're going to be peeing into those South American numbers for corn. And there are rumors that corn exports out of South America have really been tapped out at this time, meaning okay, there's a good reason why we're seeing, you know, an uptrend starting to set in in uh, new crop uh, U.S. corn. 99.47 million metric tons on the beans, slightly lower from the USDA estimate. Again, much uh, probably taking into account South American, a, a reduction in South American production and average estimates for corn or bean or oh, wheat, 268 million metric tons, about a half a million ton higher there uh, from our July report. So we'll see how those trade out. Uh, we did have our new uh, U.S. export numbers today. Pretty disappointing uh, overall uh, with corn coming in at uh, 0.192 um, uh, million, to, uh, 192,000 tons um, in both old and new crop. Uh, it was right in the middle of analyst expectations with new crop corn exports uh, being on the low end of the trade guesses. Uh, soybeans, we saw reductions, unfortunately, of 67,000 metric tons. Uh, 
there were certainly uh, certainly below analyst expectations there, in, you know, with the exception of a couple of trade guesses uh, and new crop, um, new crop coming in right in the middle of analyst range. Um, so we'll see how uh, all that plays out. Of course, wheat uh, right in the middle, kind of a nothing report, actually maybe a little disappointing on the trade, uh, but it doesn't seem that we're trading weather or uh, exports at this time. Uh, those export numbers, uh, the market seems to be enthralled uh, in its own short-term technical trends. So let's get into those right now. All right, on the daily chart here for November soybeans, uh, we talked about this old supportive area around 1300. It's the old highs that we have broke above. It's a retracement of the entire year's rally in soybeans back to you know where we came. And we got a bounce from that figure and have traded back up in the range, basically right back to the middle of the range. Um, this actually calls me to start considering um, the type of strategy that is designed to make money with time value decay and not necessarily um, uh, not necessarily a directional play. I definitely have long calls and long call spreads going. You know, we are long futures for many, uh, many traders here into today that we started to scale back on that risk in both corn and beans uh, by, by either buying, you know, protective puts, uh, you know, through the end of the week, which we'll talk about how that strategy can benefit, um, you know, really any trader going into a news event where you want to, uh, whether you're long or short, using weekly options as a way of, of managing risk and turning your long futures position or short futures position into a synthetic call or put. Um, but November beans trading uh, higher today, certainly uh, trading back through the candle and getting back above that 55 day moving average at 142 here today uh, and closing above was a good bullish signal. Uh, to me, that calls into and suggests that we will probably follow through for a test to you know, 1465 and maybe even the highs of uh, July there up around uh, 1485, or excuse me, uh, that we made into the end of July um, there on this chart. Um, so, you know, I want to see a push through yesterday's high to really confirm that, but now we have two days worth of highs here into the 1450 figure. And if we go above, uh, there's probably going to be some short covering in the near term, uh, you know, in a stop hunt, if you will, back towards the, you know, 1489 high or even as high as 1507, those old, those two old highs on this chart. Okay. 18-day moving average and 200-day moving average are down around 1391, and we're about to get a bullish cross back over of that 18-day over the 200-day moving average here uh, on this chart. Daily stochastic RSI has moved back into the overbought territory, 0.87, so we're not totally overbought yet. All good signals to suggest that, hey, follow through tonight and into tomorrow's report into new highs, not saying you sell into it, but there's probably going to be short covering or some kind of burst higher from price action today is what this chart is uh, generally saying to me at this time. All right, let's break down the smaller time frame chart now here in the November beans. Uh, we had an outside day to the downside to start the day, which then retraced uh, the majority of the day back higher. We didn't break through uh, and you know make this a bullish engulfing candle, but it's certainly a reversal candle that is worth noting. Uh, off of the most recent low though, uh, and over the last you know couple months, We've been talking pretty uh, rigorously about this 50% retracement short off the highs that was at 1437 that traded up into the 618 line at 1472. Immediately after that break, you know, I draw up 50% uh, lines off of most recent low to the high that broke that 618 line and what we refer to as an ambush setup. The market came down to 1388, got some reaction to start, and then broke the 618 line there. This is where, you know, because we have this double 6218 line break inside of this larger range, that is the signal to me to start drawing up trend lines against the lows, trend lines against the highs, and looking for a wedge-like pattern or some kind of sideways structure uh, that could be underway in this soybean market. Um, this sideways price action also brings up some of that, the idea that doing, uh, you know, strategies like strangles and being short a call or short a put at, at the same time uh, outside of the, the the bounds of this market makes sense to me, uh, and I'll look. We'll look at what one of those strategies might look like here in just a minute, uh, and it's one that I started putting to work today um, with the anticipation of more sideways price action. Uh, and, uh, and and let's just get right into that, I guess, um, because this might take a little while to discuss. All right, so I was looking at the November options here. 
the idea here is that we are looking to sell a call and sell a put that is very likely far enough away from the current market price. And certainly while we're in the middle of a range that we've been in for the last several months, um, try to put that strike as far as close to the outer bounds of this range as we can. Um, I was doing selling 1560 uh, uh, calls here, bringing in about 32 cents. Uh, they have, we have a delta of it about 0.3, which means that I need to look for a put with a 0.3 delta that also brings in about 32 cents. So by, you know, this is a margin intensive trade that has infinite risk on, you know, outside the market, outside these two strikes that we talk about. But while the market remains between those two strikes, you anticipate the price delta to keep you relatively neutral to price action and just take in time decay, which now with only 71 days left on this option is starting to accelerate. So selling a 1560 call for 32 uh, cents, let's call it, uh, and turning around and selling the 1360 put here, bringing in about 31 cents. You see it's uh, delta here of minus 27. Uh, of course, the price action moves around a little bit today from when we were doing these, but the idea that you, know, you are delta neutral in this position and bringing in just over 60 cents uh, for the market to basically stay below 1560 and above 1360 and we're right in the middle of that range at around 1460 um, This would uh, the only thing that would you know change my you know What we would need to do with this trade is if we started to get close to 1560 or 1360 We would need to you know offset the limited unlimited risk to the upside or downside But this strategy as it stands brings in 60 cents for selling both of those options and while we remain between those levels, you'll take in time decay. Uh, and honestly, the more the market chops around inside, the more both of those options are going to decay and more premium is going to be kept to the trader. And again, they have unlimited risk above 1560. You'd be assigned a short future below 1360. You'd be assigned a long future and could see uh, unlimited risk from that exposed future. But the break even on the trade puts you up towards, you know, 1590 to 1600 level and down towards the 1300 level before you'd actually start to incur uh, losses against the premium you've collected. But again, it's not a trade that you, you can set, fall asleep at the wheel with uh, and actually has high risk for in a very volatile market. A market that's going sideways though in a range like this, it's this type of trade is designed to try to bring in premium with a non-directional bias. Uh, and we don't oftentimes talk about trades and the ability to make money as a trader when the market's not moving. Um, but this is one strategy to do so now to limit the risk on this type of trade because we just brought in 60 cents for this whole trade 30 cents from each option is to turn it into what we refer to as an iron condor you buy a put or call above those strikes to then limit the risk and you effectively have on a call spread and a put spread at the same time with the intention of allowing the entire um, option strategy to decay with limited risk if the market moves above or below those uh, certain thresholds so if we stay between those thresholds, you'll collect 60 cents. So let's see how we can spend, you know, maybe 30 cents of that, 15 cents on either option to limit the risk in this market or, uh, you know, do something else. Well, um, I might get a little tighter than that and say, okay, if we're selling a 1360 put, let's look at buying a 1320 put. There's an 11 cent difference there. And that means that with that 11 cent difference, uh, we also have a uh, option strategy that is uh, has now 40 cents of risk by buying that 1320 put well that's going to be less than the 60 cents we spent so even if we go down to that threshold we should expect to be able to work out of this position uh profitably even though if we go through and you do absolutely nothing you stand to potentially only lose now 20 cents uh, at its worst um now the reason i say 20 cents is because we're going to you turn around and potentially also buy oh I don't know, the 13, the 1600 put 40 cents above the strike call that we sold uh, and spend 23 cents there. So, you know, all day you're spending 40 cents on options out, outside of the market to potentially prote uh, protect you for a move uh, and collecting 60 cents for a net 20 cents kept in your pocket. But there's an additional 20 cents of risk between those two strikes on either side. So by selling those options, and also buying these ones further uh, further out, um, not in time, but out in terms of price, uh, you limit your risk to now only 20 cents and potentially collect 20 cents if the market stays uh, you know, within those, those two strikes. 
Um, and that now becomes a limited risk trade that is designed to make money inside of these uh, this, this price action. And the way I would manage a trade going from there is, you know, watching those, those long call input. And if, you know, as time decays, if we get closer to staying in the middle of this range, you lift those calls and puts. Yes, you take a small loss on them, but the premium you're collecting from the decay of those other two uh, strikes will be making up for it. Um, and again, this is the type of trade. It isn't set it, forget it. It requires further management, but it's designed to try to make money in a sideways or non-directional price action at this time. All right, let's break down the smaller time frame here for the soybeans and let's move on to uh, the corn. Um, so coming off of this low here from 1360, we did have a 50% long uh, that traded and held at the 1392 area. That has gone up and hit its upside targets of 1445. The next in the series long will be drawn from the 1392 lows to the highs after. So this is two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. We have a trending market that's holding trend lines against the lows and holding uh, you know, 50% longs in a, in a channel trend higher. The next, that pullback from yesterday's high of 1454, pulled back to 1423. We left two open gaps on this chart below us at 1350 and 1403, and we have open gaps above us at 1534 as well. But in the near term, from a, while we're above the 1414 area, the upside target for corn or soybeans is up around the 1469 area, 1470, and would take us right up into that trend line against the highs. And take us right up into the old highs and, and test of those, those thresholds uh, and seems to be where the market is wanting to go at this time. Corn is not that much different uh, in you know, terms of its small trend we're seeing off the lows. It certainly um, from a larger time frame is lagging behind the soybeans uh, in terms of their rally from the most recent low. But I think there's definitely constructive price action for corn that to me suggests you know, now with today's close um, you know, trying to get back above that 200-day moving average could spark some short covering in the near term. Now, how high corn can go is another question altogether. Uh, but like the soybeans, corn came down and tested its cluster of old highs from the end of last year. The breakout area that we began this this year retraced all of its price action for 2022 uh, and traded really from the contract low of 1374 up to the 768 high, a 50% retracement down into the 570 area. Uh, that's a you know, two steps forward, one step back on the whole contract. 18 day moving average is now back above $6 and has been supportive here on the chart uh, over the last week. We left an open gap at 607. We'll take a look at that in a minute. But today's big figure that I think corn was trying to get back above was that 200 day moving average. And now with the close back above it here at 627 and three quarters could spark some short covering into uh, the overnight session and into uh, our you know, news report tomorrow. 55-day moving average is up around 650, kind of correlates with that old high here we had from mid-July at 658. 666 happens to be the 50% retracement from the highs to lows. We'll look at that in a minute. And the 100-day moving average up around 680. So December corn's ability to get back above 680 and $7 is way too soon to call. There's a lot of levels, as I just mentioned, we need to chew through to get there. But corn, at least on the short term, does look like it is trying to get there. Um, so one of the positions that, uh, well, let's break down the, the, that 15 minute chart first, and then we'll get into positionally some of the things I was looking at here today. Um, okay. So open gap at 673 on the way down, 730 above. On the way back up here, we've left an open gap at 584 and $6. Those open gaps we've left on these charts below us are another reason why I'm fearful Fearful that into the September through November timeframe, corn and soybeans might make a new harvest low and clean up those charts uh, would be a good reason for them to do that. Uh, and any kind of new spike higher today could easily easily clean up the gaps we have, um, you know, above us, you know, and then be met with a wall of selling pressure um, where, you know, lots of producers uh, that I know that didn't take advantage of corn sales and bean sales at the favorable prices we had in the middle of the summer are going to want to take advantage of that now okay and the big question is is that offset by you know speculative uh buying in the market as well as commercial demand which can come in the you know to the tune of china buying uh via our futures market if they're not doing so via the cash markets yet but we are seeing china buying on the cash side and oftentimes we would see them um you know selling futures against that as a hedge 
uh, and trying to play both sides of, the, of our markets uh, in various degrees. Corn uh, tested its 6218 line on its pullback from 561. Uh, it never really stayed below it. It just broke it uh, at 590. And uh, upside targets from that pull could take us to 5, 654. Uh, my concern is, of course, that we broke it at all, but we seem to be holding trend lines. And certainly, just like the soybean market uh, coming up off of that low from uh, two Wednesdays ago, we held a 50%, let me get my FIB tool here. We held a 50% long from the 587 lows up to the highs thereafter. 601 held. We went up to its targets at 621. The market traded from uh, lows to highs here back into its next in the series 50% level. So two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, just like soybeans. We're channel channeling higher. And we have trend lines against the lows that have started a short-term intraday trend higher for, for December corn. From the 612 area, 630 is our potential upside targets. It seems like that's uh, the price action of the last two days. It's just been the market trying to find its way up to that target area. So now that it's breaking uh, potentially above that high, above the 200-day moving average, as we mentioned, uh, I think the 636 uh, highs from the, uh, you know, at the end of the month of July there are probably within striking uh, range now. And a break of this trend line against the highs that we've had uh, and that we've been holding since uh, you know, late June all through July and into August certainly brings me uh, or you know, causes me to believe corn might be heading towards 660 to 666, which then you know would be the 50% retracement from its contract highs up around 766 to those lows that we made after. There is the open gap up around 673. That is probably a very viable upside target for this market at this time too. So I'm not saying corn is going 40 cents higher, you know, just on tomorrow's news, but we have set up at least in a short-term trend that until it fails, the assumption is, is that corn is going to continue higher until it does. Uh, and everything that I'm looking at here seems to suggest that we could, um, you know, could be gearing up for a little bit of a burst higher uh, in the near term. Now, a failure of these trends could, of course, result in a retest of the 570, you know, low and, and going even lower. Uh, and we can't rule that out either, but at least in the near term, the trend is up until it's not, uh, you know, for December corn at this time. All right, let's uh, let's see what else do we want to take a look at here today. Um, bean oil has been incredibly strong here over the last several uh, days. Um, it's I think finding a bottom alongside the crude oil market, um, and uh, has begun its own trend, uh, you know, higher off of its lows. We broke above the 55-day moving average here today at 66.30. The 100-day moving average is coming in around 68.38. We're up into the full 50% retracement from its highs to lows here, uh, and certainly in overbought territory. Um, bean oil on the smaller time frame, though. Let's take a look at the short-term trend and why uh, I think a little we got a little higher to go now, and we're putting some serious pressure on the bears right now uh, in the bean complex. Uh, a 50% retracement from the 54.40 uh, lows to highs, basically a 50% retracement for July's price action occurred around the 60 handle. Uh, upside targets of 68.84 seem to be uh, in in route, and the 61.8 lines here up around 69.60 um, are within striking distance now for bean oil on a move higher. Um, taking out that 61.8 line and getting the 70 would suggest to me that we might have, in fact, have a bottom in place for oil, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I seen. Uh, going to continue higher without retesting those, you know, the low 50s or the mid 50s. But um, certainly with crude oil heading higher and bean oil heading higher right now, uh, soybeans have a good prospect uh, for for being bullish, uh, you know, at this time. Um, so continuing to monitor that and looking for a little more upside price action. Crude oil getting back above 94 bucks today, certainly breaking out of its uh, multi-day consolidation we had down here at Lowe's breaking out of its most aggressive trend line, uh, puts crude now into testing the trend lines and the channel resistance that we've been holding uh, in this decline we've seen in crude since, um, I don't even know why that line's on the chart, since the 123 highs. Equal legs down of this first leg from 130 down to uh, 93, extend that from the 123 high, came in at 86. We didn't quite get there. Um, uh, but we did complete, you know, seven swings lower in crude oil. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, which completes, you know, a larger three-wave correction uh, from an Elliott wave standpoint. 
And so breaking back above uh, these old lows here at 93 and 93.60 respectively from April and uh, or March and April um, could lead to, you know, another test of 100 and certainly a test back to 105. Uh, back to the you know some of the pivots and resistances we've seen before. Uh, yesterday's price action and the day before, you know, we we had inside price action that resulted in a move higher. We then fell back in a range. I would call all this you know capitulation and consolidation at lows. And now uh, the market moving higher. Uh, we want to be you know on the lookout for you know a retracement on crude and for support. Looking back towards that 91 figure. 91 to 90 now uh, as supportive for crude if it gets down there. But uh, in my opinion, I think we might be heading higher here in the near term before we see one of those pullbacks uh, ensue. But in the near term, uh, at least crude oil seems to be picking itself up off of the uh, floor. Uh, can't rule out another swing down to 86 to fill that larger upward sloping trend line. Uh, test that or the, um, uh, let's look at the daily chart here or that equal eggs. You can see that upward sloping trend line now that I'm talking about on this chart, but uh, this does seem like a pretty nasty correction for crude oil, but could be the completion of a correction for all intents and purposes at this time. Uh, we're going to need to see follow through above today's high of 95 and certainly 96 figures for me to be totally convinced. Um, but this is where, you know, a situation where if you haven't already, you know, looking at spreads um call spreads you know the 100 105 one you know 98 to 108 call spreads in crude oil are good ways of getting limited uh and finite uh risk uh and then you know getting some exposure for a move um in crude back higher and you know it's not even not even getting bullish enough to say we need to go to new all-time our new highs or new all-time highs but certainly a move back towards you know median a reversion to the median of this range that we've been in back towards 110 would send call spreads of that magnitude, you know, in the money. Uh, and all, of course, with, you know, limited and finite risk, of course. Um, uh, live cattle here today making a move, not really seeing the follow through with the feeders, which is unfortunate. Um, but uh, live cattle still stair stepping higher. We have a pretty good uh, little uptrend and trend channel that we're following in this market. Uh, the market's, you know, held 50% retracements, went to target. Next in the series here from entry lows to target highs, went to target again at 144.80. Next in the series from 141 up to that 144 high, traded at 143. Uh, and now the market's you know, trading up towards its 145 targets and getting very close to closing that open gap that we've had at 146 here on the live cattle. Now, I mentioned uh, just a moment ago that I'm a little cautious about cattle because we haven't seen the follow through from the feeders here today. Uh, but feeders too are following you know, a stair stepping pattern of uh, of uh, of price action uh, in a series uh, higher from this 181 low uh, have upside targets of a new contract high of 190 but today's kind of double top failure into that 188 area not getting follow through on the feeders which are typically our leader uh, and not following the fats higher uh, leads me to believe that you know watch out if fat cattle roll over here and feeders haven't followed through we might very well be making a top in the cattle complex uh, as we seasonally typically do at this time of year. And certainly, um, you know, the charts are suggesting that there isn't much in the way of uh, follow through at this time that I am concerned, uh, you know, about. Wheat markets, um, I'm going to actually begin our discussion of wheat today with the that protein spread, the KC Chicago spread that we've been talking about. Uh, channeling beautifully higher right now uh, off of that 55 area. Uh, trading to the end of the day of 64.75. Um, I'm anticipating, you know, continued follow through above that 70 cents over figure uh, and a move back towards the 80 cents over. We are into the resistance area, but a break of that, you know, is kind of what I'm looking for uh, on this chart. And of course, there's nothing that can stop this market or, you know, there's, yes, I should rephrase that. There's no reason to believe we couldn't get back to a, a dollar over, um, you know, you know, in the protein premium if wheat in general, um, finds a uh, finds a better uh, you know a better finds a low effectively at this time chicago wheat uh retraded its uh pre um pre-ukrainian crisis lows pulled into a full 50 percent retracement of its contract at 873 uh and uh so far we've really just had inside price action for the month of july and into august that um seems you know to me that if we can get a break above this 842 area would ignite the market in some short covering towards $9 and above. 
The next in the series, 50% short, though, from 940 highs down to lows here, you know, has been trading and holding that resistance at 853. So, again, 880 is kind of my magic, one of my magic lines or numbers and lines in the sand that I'm looking for the market to try to clamor back above um, to start really positioning long in wheat. Uh, and, you know, long in a market where we could see, um, could see a substantial rally here in the near term. Uh, let's look at December KC wheat uh, for a second because this is a market very similar to Chicago, only you know trading at that premium of 64 cents as I mentioned. Um, one of the trades that I'm looking to establish, if you know you're not in that protein spread already, is any buying in wheat that I'm looking to do will be in the KC contract, um, and then we'll be looking to sell Chicago against it uh, because even in times when you know the wheat outright futures turned bearish over the last several months, that KC Chicago wheat spread was still being bull spread um, in that, in, in, you know, there was premium going to the uh, KC wheat with the better premium or better protein quality uh, there and certainly being driven from our export markets. So if you're looking to capitalize on, you know, the idea that Ukraine's not going to get as much and Russia isn't going to get as much wheat out in the global market, uh, if India and Australia have poor crops, if uh, you know, coupled with um, coupled with just generally speaking, an improvement in that protein uh, spread, uh, KC wheat is should be the favorable contract uh, relative to the Chicago. Uh, a break back above nine dollars, very similar to Chicago. You know, we've got you know some trend lines against the highs that I think uh, we've we've really you know started to break up back above, and this long term kind of uh, rounding bottom forming for the wheat complex means that. There's relatively limited risk to the downside, you know, stop below $8 on KC wheat. Yeah, it's 90 cents of risk, but if this market gets going and gets back above nine, $10 is gonna be, uh, I think, seen fairly quickly. And a back above 10, you know, now we can start talking about a move back to contract high. So in terms of risk reward, risking 50 cents to a dollar in the wheat um, for a move that could be two, three or $4 makes, risk, makes sense, but I think there's better ways of skinning that cat via call spreads or, you know, trading the, uh, the, the, the KC Chicago wheat spread um, at this time. So, all right, well, that pretty much wraps up today's strategy of the week webinar. Um, I guess one last chart I want to call to our attention because it is that time of year. Let's take a look at the September bonds real quick. Uh, we were in a pretty good trend off of its lows and, uh, and drawing trend lines against those lows. You know, we started to break below them. Uh, here today, but we are down into the 618 line of its next in the series long. Um, you know, can't rule out that, you know, September bonds might do a full 50% retracement down to the 138 area. And I'm not so convinced that even with the Fed uh, hiking rates here uh, is going to be enough to send this market down to uh, a new low. Taking, pulling up the continuous contract for, uh, and a continuous daily contract at that for the, uh, for the bonds, um, this doesn't look like a very bullish bounce at this time. And, you know, today's price action certainly changed my opinion slightly. And I'm a little bit more opt cautiously optimistic. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, getting back below the 131 area on the bonds with the current rate rising environment, I just don't think the Fed is doing enough. And we could be backing ourselves into a wall. And if we do hear more clamors of a recession, it's going to be very tough to keep this market from getting back to a test of its channel resistance at 153 and certainly back to the 50% retracement from the 166 highs down to the lows there around 148. So I am still looking for the bonds to head a little higher at this time, which you know suggests that the market might actually, um, might actually see a period of U.S. dollar weakness. And on that note, let's take a look at the Dixie real quick um, because that's certainly a... Um, you know, the bonds selling off today didn't exactly show a major reversal on the Dixie chart higher. Uh, and, the, and, and the dollar index has traded back below its 18-day moving average now, uh, holding it as resistance last week. We've traded down into the 55-day moving average around 105, with the 100, 130 to 100 range being kind of a, or 103, excuse me, 100-day moving average being the next, uh, next uh, level to the downside to con consider. Uh, let's bring up the daily nearest on this and look at a continuous contract for the dollar index. There we go. 
because this old high here at 103 seems to be where we are coming down to retest. The 200-day move, 200-day moving average is, is quickly coming higher, and I think it'll you know find its way up to 101 to 102 before we get down there. But testing the 103 to 100 area is you know when you take a really big step back on this chart is a test back down to the old highs of the range that we were in for the prior last like 20 years. So a pullback towards 100 on the Dixie is probably in the works. And if that's going to be the case, I would expect to see the bond market rallying still uh, and the Fed probably not hiking interest rates as much as we're anticipating in the next and in, in following meetings. So, you know, now the Fed fund futures are only looking for a half a basis point hike. That's, you know, smaller than the three three quarter basis point hike that, you know, the market was pricing in before. So even the market is starting to anticipate, you know, a stronger bond market, uh, lower interest rate hikes, and even the Fed going into a more qualitative easing type period um, that uh, even maybe the dollar index having topped off now uh, might be suggesting as well. So keep an eye out for a test down to the 100-day moving average around 103.30 and a test down to the 200-day, which comes in around 100 at this point. That would be a major test of inflection zone and certainly falling back below those levels would be the dollar index you know, falling back into the levels that we've been in for the last 20 years and back into a range you know, that could see a period of decline for the dollar um, against the global basket of currencies that it is tracked against. So that pretty much wraps up today's Strategy of the Week webinar, everybody. Thank you for joining me. And again, to get this webinar every week and get on the mailing list to be a part of it, sign up in those links in the comment section and information section of this video. Um, I uh, love hearing from everybody, so give me a call at any time at 312-277-0110. You can find me on Twitter and on Facebook, or shoot me an email at dhussey at zaner.com. Have a great day, everybody, and we will be back with you as price action develops.